photos on the online newspapers disappeared. At the same time, the paparazzi's identity was also discovered by the Heaven Lounge. The paparazzi, as well as the several newspapers that had released the photos, were blacklisted in the city. It was then that everyone knew that the World Poker Tour covered the Heaven Lounge's back. No one in the upper social circle dared to cause trouble in the Heaven Lounge. Since James had never been to such a place before, he was a little unaccustomed to it and felt uncomfortable all over. On the contrary, Tucker looked much calmer than him. Zeke glanced over James and Tucker. He had even bought Tucker a gift from abroad. As luck would have it, it was a game console. Although he was 35 years old, age had never left a trace on Zeke's face. His facial features were just the right kind of beauty, a pair of beautiful eyes with a romantic and distinguished temperament lighting them from the inside. His eyelashes were extremely long and covered the edge of his eyes when they slightly hung down. His frame was slender and well-proportioned, and his whole body was like a fine carving. Over the course of the day, James had too much to drink. He raised a glass to Zeke. In the past, someone scouted me to be a model, but I didn't go. At this point, he was already a little drunk. In a good mood, Zeke glanced at Tucker gently. Tucker, do you like my gift? He had brought back the game console after hearing from Jack that Tucker liked playing games. Jack stood watching at the side, feeling very surprised. He didn't expect the usually unapproachable Zeke to like Tucker so much. Lowering his head and glancing at the game console, Tucker hesitated and then said, I like it. Zeke smiled and reached out to ruffle his hair. Then he took Tucker and James back to the Park Place apartments. After the two were settled, Zeke walked back to the car with his hands behind his back. Tucker said that he has a sister but why aren't we picking her up together? It was obvious from his tone that he really wanted to meet that sister. The fourth son is like a tiger watching his prey. I don't even dare to bring James back to the old house. Jack shook his head. I was afraid of something going wrong. When I first found James, he hadn't even attended university. Zeke's brows rose when he heard this. After a day of filming, he was already showing exhaustion in his face. No matter what, she's still part of the Miller family, and also my niece. We have already found my brother, but I don't even know what his daughter looks like. He took a handkerchief from his assistant and said lethargically, Give me information on my brother's daughter. I'll find her. Jack paused and then said, Actually... Keith found out that Tucker's sister is studying in Evanston. I've done a little research. Zeke raised his eyebrows and waited for further information. Jack bowed his head in shame. But I found nothing. Zeke was surprised. Although the Miller family was already in decline, they were still incomparable to ordinary families. Tucker's sister. How could they not find anything on her? Do you think anything happened? Zeke sat up straight and glanced at him. Has my other brother shown any movement over this matter? The fourth son was cruel and even united with the Flake family to devour the Miller family's properties. Over the years, Zeke had also found hints that James's disappearance in the past was inextricably linked to the fourth son's mother. Jack paused and realized the seriousness of this matter. I'll get people to look into it again. The next day, Bessie got up earlier than usual, at six in the morning. At the moment, she was sitting at the dining table finishing her meal. After reading all night and not sleeping well, she yawned sleepily. She looked up and saw Michael with her backpack. Leave it there, I have to go to school later. He raised the backpack and casually said, I'll drop you on my way. I'm going to school. Bessie followed him after finishing her milk. I'm going to the medical laboratory. The campus is on the way. Michael took the keys and leaned on the door, waiting for her to change shoes. Bessie followed him to the elevator after changing her shoes. Holding the flower pot, Marvin followed far behind them. 
Since Bessie was living in the school now, Marvin wanted to take the potted plant over. Early in the morning, not many people could be seen on the road. Michael drove the car to the school gate before stopping. He walked in front while Bessie followed two or three steps behind him. There was an avenue inside the school gate, and the sports field could be seen by walking a few steps past the gate. People were still running in the morning at this time. Michael looked down at the time on his wristwatch. It's still early. Would you like to go to the medical laboratory? He asked. It wasn't seven o'clock yet. He also knew that Bessie had no class during the first period today. She only came to school at this time to read at the library. When he said that she could read at the Highline Apartments, she said it was too distracting. Uninterested, Bessie waved her hand. It smells of formaldehyde. I don't want to go. At the intersection along the path, she took her backpack from him and casually slung it behind her. Bye. She raised her hand without looking back. Marvin rushed to Michael with the flower pot. That's strange. How did Miss Miller know that the medical laboratory smells of formaldehyde? The library opened at 7 o'clock sharp. Bessie went in with her student card and found a seat before gathering up some books. As soon as she returned to her seat, a Twitter message popped up on her phone. Tucker had texted, and the tone of it was as if he was sharing a treasure with her. Sister, do you want to meet her uncle? Bessie put the books on the table, then picked up her phone. She answered very concisely. No, Tucker didn't reply right away. Picking up her pen and reading her book, it was a long time before Bessie received Tucker's reply. Tucker just sent one word. Oh. Raising an eyebrow, she put the phone aside and continued flipping slowly through the book. Most of the books on nuclear engineering were theoretical knowledge points, complicated and tedious. Whenever she encountered a particularly difficult problem, she would write it down and then ask the professor after class. The science and technology department had assigned several laboratory professors this time to avoid this situation. After all, due to the lack of laboratory professors at the beginning of last year, Luke had shot all the lecturers down with his questions. After this was repeated a few times, all the professional teachers who taught Luke went crazy and jointly sent a letter to the dean. Once the dean knew about this, he ended up giving Luke the contact numbers of several laboratory professors. On the other end of the phone, Tucker put his textbooks into his school bag and weakly took the bag downstairs. Tucker, are you feeling unwell? Keith took the car keys and drove Tucker to school. He asked in concern after seeing his state. No, Tucker shook his head. Then, glanced down at his phone again before following Keith downstairs. Zeke's manager arrived at the Miller family's house early in the morning and was holding a contract. Film God. At the sight of Zeke, he showed him the contract in his hand. This is the variety show you signed on for last time. Zeke had been working very hard since his debut many years ago and had made a lot of money in the entertainment industry. But most of his funds had been given to Jack for temporary operation. He accepted both TV series and movies. This year, the fourth son's oppression of his family line had already come to light. But Jack only had three programmers left. So Zeke had taken on a large-scale reality show. With his status and it being his first time accepting a reality show, his appearance fee was sky high. In fact, Zeke's current qualifications in the entertainment industry weren't suitable for reality shows, and he should have concentrated on being in movies instead, but he had been in urgent need of money. No one had expected that after returning from filming a movie, Jack would use an intelligent system to get back the shares that had been swallowed by the fourth son. Because of this, the Miller family's roots had gradually recovered. Because of these shares, Jack wasn't short of money for the time being, but Zeke had already signed the contract and didn't intend to break it. Put it on the table. Zeke slowly picked up a sandwich. Get ready, I'm taking Tucker out for dinner tonight. The manager glanced at him in surprise. It seems like you really like that kid. We hit it off. 
Zeke finished eating and wiped his hands with a paper towel. Bringing a cup of warm coffee over to Zeke, Jack asked the manager what reality show it was and whether it was dangerous. The manager explained it to him. This reality show was the most popular one in America, with a total of over 1 million hits on every major platform on the internet. Jack naturally had watched the show and hesitated for a while. I've watched this reality show before. It seems to be filmed with family members. Jack, our company has a lot of amateurs who aren't very popular. If the film god wants to film those parts, these companies will naturally arrange for people to play his family. The manager understood his concerns and explained all of this with a smile. As part of the entertainment industry, outsiders thought that Zeke's family was a good starting point and he had it easy. But only a few people knew how difficult it was for him to develop his work in the early days under the fourth son's suppression. Episode 282. That's Noah's Arranger. Jack had also helped him deal with many things in the early stages and naturally knew the twists and turns of the entertainment industry. Hearing Zeke's words, he suddenly thought of something. Why don't you use Tucker instead of those amateurs this time? It's better than having those amateurs rise to popularity after the show. Tucker is so good looking, much better than those amateurs. The audience will surely like him, and you can even bring him around with you openly. Zeke was a little moved after hearing this. Seeing that he was really considering it, the manager was caught between laughter and tears. Film God, Jack doesn't understand, but how could you consider this? The entertainment industry is a magnifying glass, and every move will be magnified. You know about cyberbullying and how it'll affect the development of children. Tucker is young, but he is also very well behaved and smart. How could he possibly behave badly and have people hate him? Zeke stared disapprovingly at the manager. The manager shut up and spoke no more, afraid that Zeke would find Tucker on the spot if he rambled on. If he hadn't been Zeke's manager since he was 20, he would almost think that Tucker was his illegitimate child. When Bessie returned to her dormitory at noon, after class was over, there was already a potted plant on the table. Kara turned sideways, took off her earphones, and pointed to the potted flower plant. The resident assistant brought it up when I came back. Glancing at it, Bessie saw that it was the one Marvin had brought along that morning. Kara had been playing games, but since all her cards were gone, she chatted with Bessie instead. I didn't know you grew flowers. Bessie went to check her face in the bathroom. I just water it, I don't grow it. This was her first time seeing Bessie after the holidays, and since they were alone in the bedroom, Kara whispered in inquiry. Bessie, do you really want to study your second major and only take the first major's examinations? I heard that Northwestern University's midterm and final exams are very difficult, and it's very troublesome if you fail to meet the standards. I heard from the seniors that it's especially difficult this year. She sounded very worried. Denora's words last time obviously had an impact on her. It's particularly difficult this year? Bessie's focus wasn't on the same things as Kara's. Putting down the mouse, Kara rested her chin in her hand. The counselor said that. He doesn't know the specific details either, but he just told me to be more attentive in class. Oh. Bessie sat back down in her chair. Glancing at her, Kara remembered the timetable she had checked in the morning. By the way, we're going out for lunch this afternoon. There's a delicious shop on the snack street. Bessie looked up and leaned against the back of the chair as she suddenly thought of something. I might not be able to go. You don't have class this afternoon. Don't lie to me. Kara immediately took out a photo of Bessie's nuclear engineering course schedule that she had copied down. No, I have to meet a friend, said Bessie, casually propping up her legs. It was two o'clock in the afternoon, and Noah was in a room on the second floor inside a quiet afternoon clubhouse near Northwestern University. Noah, 
If the boss knows that I took the liberty of taking you away from the commercial shooting scene without authorization, he will definitely beat me to death. The concert is nearing and your fans are everywhere in Evanston, let alone on the college campus. The assistant pondered. What friend are you meeting? Noah took off his mask and the glasses on the bridge of his nose and put them aside. He didn't reply to his assistant. Two knocks sounded on the door calmly. Noah stood up and walked towards the door. The assistant stared at him. Noah, don't open the door just like that if... Before he finished speaking, Noah had already opened the door. A young girl stood outside, wearing a peaked cap that covered her face. Noah turned sideways to let her in and then closed the door. As she walked in, she took off her black peaked cap and casually revealed her face. It was Bessie. Staring at her face, the assistant's eyes widened. She was so beautiful. She looked like a college student. Was she a student from the university town? To meet her, Noah had even pushed a commercial and came all the way to such a dangerous place like the university town. After all the reasoning, the assistant finally realized the truth. With trembling fingers, he didn't dare make a call in front of Noah. Afraid of looking at them and being silenced, he only dared take out his phone and send a message to someone labeled, Boss Simon. Boss, Noah has a secret girlfriend. Boss Simon just replied with one character, a question mark. Simon Osborne was Noah's manager, and he was also the company's leader. So the juniors and even some artists addressed him as Boss Simon. The assistant had only spent a short while in the entertainment industry, and his desire for gossip was ignited. He quietly informed Simon about the incident and described the secret girlfriend. Do you know what Noah is doing with the VIP floor tickets for his concert? He gave them all to her. When did Noah ever do such a thing? Boss Simon, why aren't you replying? After a long while, Boss Simon slowly replied, That's not Noah's girlfriend. That's Nico Soup, Noah's arranger. I am going back to work. Look out for paparazzi. Simon was still slowly drinking his tea. He typed slowly and sent a message. He even told the little assistant to entertain the great god arranger. The assistant held his phone in a daze. Like most people, he was Noah's fan. He was also familiar with Noah's history. From Noah's debut, it was his first single that shot him to popularity on the internet. Then, he had been scouted to participate in a draft selection. Ever since his debut, one name was bound to him. The god-level arranger that was a ghost in the industry, Nico Soup. Even Noah's fans had tried finding out about this Nico Soup. Countless musicians wanted to dig into this by bribing Noah's staff members. A paparazzi team had even followed Noah for three consecutive months, investigating the people around him, but still failing to find Nico Soup. The other party was too mysterious to dig up. Had Simon just said, this incredibly good-looking and young girl was the god-level arranger Nico Soup. No wonder the paparazzi couldn't find anything. Even if she appeared in front of Noah openly, no one would guess that she was Nico Soup. The assistant stood there, his mind blank. Knock, knock. Another knock sounded outside, and then a waiter's voice was heard. The assistant immediately returned to his senses. Before Noah reacted, he opened the door, a small slit, and then took the tray from the waiter. A few desserts and cakes were on it. The assistant respectfully handed Bessie the coffee before heading back to Noah's side. He was respectful, as if Bessie were his father. Nico, are you very busy recently? Noah stirred the coffee with a spoon and glanced at her, casually folding the tickets and stuffing them into her pocket. Bessie replied, Somewhat. The assistant stared as Bessie nonchalantly folded the tickets. No wonder. Noah glanced faintly at her, then continued blankly. Do you remember the arrangement you owe me? Bessie just leaned back in her chair and rubbed her forehead. Military training had started since school reopened, and then she had to go to the training base. 
Noah's arrangement had kept being delayed. Two more days, she replied, after thinking for a while with an aching head. Bessie wanted to go to the library. She only chatted for a while with Noah before leaving with her backpack. After she left, the assistant stared in her direction intently. Then he stammered and seemed to return to his senses. Noah, just, just now, she's the great arranger Nico Soup? He predicted that the entertainment industry would go crazy if they knew this. In the evening, when Michael came back from the medical laboratory, he saw Joshua sitting in the hall. Dad? Michael changed his shoes at the door and unhurriedly asked, What's the matter? Joshua looked behind him with a smile, as if looking for someone. Behind Michael, Marvin appeared with a wooden face. He hurriedly bowed when he saw Joshua and said, Mr. Clark. At the sight of Marvin, Joshua's smile dropped. His usually imposing expression reappeared and his eyelids drooped as he simply nodded emotionlessly. Marvin was speechless. Sitting down as usual on the sofa, Michael took the cup of coffee Marvin offered him and slowly took a sip. Then, he leaned back on the sofa with a tired expression. Joshua glanced at him. The White family is coming back from Austria. They have already achieved results from the developing market there. He said. Michael nodded. Oh, we have a family dinner this evening. Remember to come over. Joshua suddenly felt suffocated by Michael and stood up. The Clark family held a family dinner every month. This time, it was mainly to have the White family over. If they really opened a market in Austria, this would have a great impact on the other families and also change Evanston's layout. At the Clark family's banquet, the others arrived very early, while Rosemary and Michael came right on the dot. Marvin followed behind them. The two seats to the left of Joshua were reserved for them. Marvin respectfully stood behind Michael. At the sight of them, the other members of the Clark family frowned to themselves. Everyone's here. Let's eat first. Joshua wore an expensive suit. He glanced at the people at the table, then picked up his fork. Aaron should know best about the White family's affairs. He checked with Miss Flake last time. The Clark family's hallmaster said. The others nodded. That's right. Everyone was discussing Aaron. Sitting beside Michael, Rosemary wasn't concerned about Aaron's matters. She picked up a piece of vegetable and whispered, Bessie still didn't come back with you? Michael just picked up his fork, calmly lowered his head and replied with a smile. Has your company made up for the shortcomings today? Gritting her teeth, Rosemary still laughed along and put a piece of meat into Michael's bowl. Come, brother, eat this. It's your favorite. They conversed amongst themselves. Episode 283 Information About Tucker's Sister Opposite them, Aaron couldn't help but sneer. Brother, I heard that you have a girlfriend now. Why didn't you bring her for us to see? Speaking of which, sister, you've also been hanging out with our brother and his girlfriend recently. You've even forgotten about the cooperation with the World Poker Tour. I wonder how it is. Aaron had always been at odds with the other two siblings. Joshua glanced at him with an aching head. Enough! Joshua obviously favored Rosemary, but this didn't bother Aaron. He picked up his wine glass and took a sip. Standing behind Michael, Marvin looked up expressionlessly. Don't you know? Aaron glanced up at him, surprised that he had spoken up. Like Michael, Marvin was almost invisible in the Clark family. What? Rosemary has already signed an agreement with the World Poker Tour yesterday. She's the first of the four major families to cooperate with the World Poker Tour. Marvin sounded a little simple-minded, but his words were like thunder to the people at the table. Hearing this, even the usually calm Joshua couldn't help being surprised. Rosemary, is that true? Putting down her fork, Rosemary lightly replied, I just signed the agreement. 
I wanted the forces to stabilize before telling you. Aaron's smile froze. The big families in Evanston eyed the World Poker Tour covetously, and no one dared to move recklessly. Aaron had also contacted the World Poker Tour before, but he had received no response. Hadn't Rosemary encountered some problems in her company recently? How did she successfully sign a contract with the World Poker Tour? How did she do it? Aaron no longer had the mood to listen to her conversation with the others. His head was about to explode and he couldn't think of how Rosemary managed to sign the contract. While he was lost in thought, Rosemary also glanced thoughtfully at Marvin. She found a chance to lean back to him, smiling with raised eyebrows. Marvin, how did you know I signed the agreement? She didn't believe Bessie would have told him. Marvin lowered his head. He paused and then said, I guessed. Zeke parked the car by the school's gate. Since it wasn't convenient for him to get out, he sent Tucker a message with his location. Then he turned on his Bluetooth headset. A hoarse female voice said, Mr. Miller, we found a piece of information. Putting his hands on the steering wheel, he noticed Tucker coming out of the school gate. His brows slightly relaxed and he politely said, I'll let the finance department call you for the deposition later. Please send the information to my mailbox. The voice on the other end was still very hoarse. Okay. Hanging up, he took off the headset and looked out. Tucker glanced at the opposite side of the road. Having received Zeke's message, he knew the license plate number, the car's color, and where Zeke had parked. So he saw the car at a glance. Then, he walked to Zeke's car with his backpack and opened the door for the passenger seat. Instead of taking him to the hotel, Zeke took him back to his apartment. The apartment building he lived in was home to many entertainers and was extremely private. Zeke had nothing to hide and took Tucker right in. Welcome, I've already told your father that you're staying with me tonight. Zeke gave him a pair of slippers at the entrance. He took two steps forward and continued. This is your room. There are computers and game consoles inside. You can play first while I cook. He heard from Jack that this child was a little antisocial and liked to play games. Hence, he had spent the day getting people to organize the room and had bought a lot of hard-to-find game consoles. He went to the kitchen to turn down the gas for the soup and to marinate the chicken wings. Tucker left the door to the room open, and when Zeke glanced inside, he saw him playing a game with his headphones and a mouse. Beside him, the game discs were stacked up. Grinning, he suddenly thought of something while watching Tucker. He returned to his own room, turned on the computer, and logged into his email. There was the information on Tucker's sister that he had asked someone to check today. Having been in the entertainment industry for so many years, Zeke had his own film studio and connections. Since Jack hadn't been able to find out about Bessie, he'd had to check the matter out himself. The soup in the kitchen was still boiling as he clicked on the top email. The attached file was about 100 kilobytes. He downloaded it and glanced roughly at it. He had a good memory and hardly spent any effort memorizing lines during filming. Although this document was very long, he could read 10 lines at a time and finished it in less than 10 minutes. A few photos were attached at the bottom. Zeke couldn't help but frown. Worry flooded his heart. After meeting Tucker, he'd had great expectations for his two sisters, but he hadn't expected to receive such content. When someone knocked on the door outside, he finally released the mouse he had been gripping tightly. Come in. Zeke, how long has your soup been simmering? His manager came in wearing an apron. I stewed it in the afternoon. Turn off the heat after another 20 minutes. Zeke opened the drawer and took out a cigarette. Surprised, the manager stared at him. What happened? Did someone put you in a bind or did something bad happen on the fourth sun side? Neither. I found some information. Zeke turned the laptop sideways and turned to the manager. Take a look. The manager pushed his glasses up the bridge of his nose. His eyes narrowed. Anne? He read slower than Zeke, but was also frowning by halfway through the document. 
No, Zeke, listen to me. We can't acknowledge this person. This document was surprisingly Anne's data. The flyleaf of each page had a 129 mark. The manager had known Zeke for many years and naturally knew his social connections. If it was 129, it was certainly real. The information was very detailed, including stuff like how Anne never saw James after going to the Smith family's house and how she avoided other people at school every time. Some information about Grace was also included. I know. Zeke flicked the soot. Tucker seems to like her very much. Without Tucker, even if the Miller family took Anne back with great fanfare, Zeke wouldn't even spare her a glance. That's not the way. The manager sighed. Once we acknowledge this Anne, havoc will ensue. I'll ask Tucker about it later. Zeke smiled faintly and snuffed out the cigarette butt. He couldn't believe Tucker liked Anne so much, and he remembered Jack saying that there were two daughters. He had also asked Tucker in the car today. At the mention of his sister, Tucker had shut up and gone back to playing his game console without a word. Back at Northwestern University, Bessie had returned to the female dormitory. Instead of going to the library that night, she took a shower, then sat down with a stack of blank papers. She wrote a line of notes on the paper. Noah's music style was changeable. Last year, it was mainly an ethnic lyrical style, but this year, it was rock and roll. It was a big breakthrough, but Bessie failed to receive inspiration and just crushed one paper after the other. Kara sat on the table beside her and was about to ask her to join a game. Seeing Bessie drawing notes on the paper, she couldn't help but ask, Bessie, you've studied music before? In her earphones, the boys in her class asked, Kara, what's up? Is Bessie playing? Bessie ignored her question, so Kara looked away and said quietly, Nope. The boys in their class were taken aback. Is she still reading? No. Kara chose her card. You might not believe it, but she's writing down musical notes. Bessie wrote for a while and still found it unsatisfactory. Putting the pen down, she received a Twitter video call at that moment. It was Clarissa. She thought about it before taking her earphones to the balcony and picking them up. I took an order today. In the video, Clarissa took a can of beer from the refrigerator, walked to the sofa and opened it with one hand. Leaning on the balcony, Bessie put on the earphones and raised an eyebrow. Is it related to me? Almost, Clarissa said. It's mainly to check on your father, James's children. I only realized the connection to you after checking, so I erased your information and only left Anne's. Clarissa had never investigated Bessie's general information. She had only found out that she was Anne's older sister after doing this order today. Bessie guessed who had placed the order after hearing this. Half sitting on the balcony, she bit into the leaf she had picked from the flower and said rather indifferently, Go on. The person who placed the order is Zeke Miller. Clarissa sat down on the sofa and took a sip of beer. He helped me once when I was a paparazzi and is part of the Miller family. Do you want me and the boss to help you solve this trouble? No need. Smiling, Bessie reached out and climbed over the balcony railing. Before dropping to the ground, she spat out the leaf from her mouth her eyebrows drawn and her eyes full of a bright and evil glint, even in the dim lights. I'll do it myself. Understood. Clarissa wasn't concerned. Crushing the beer can, she casually threw it and it flew directly into the trash can with a bang. I'm hanging up. The next day, Bessie received a call from Tucker early in the morning. What's the matter? Bessie was headed to the library with her backpack on. On the other end of the line, Tucker was sitting on the toilet seat. He whispered, Bessie, can I participate in our variety show with our uncle? He said it's very fun. Bessie understood that this uncle would be Zeke, the one Clarissa had talked about last night. This was the first time Tucker had shown such obvious affection for someone. Fun? Bessie entered the library and walked over to the last row of tables by the window. She threw her backpack onto the table, 
leaned against a chair, and started fiddling with the earphone cable. Episode 284 The Fated Meeting I'm not sure, so I'm asking you, Tucker whispered. Bessie unzipped her bag and took out a textbook as well as a notebook. What about Dad? You can discuss it with him. I can't ask him. Tucker glanced at the closed door and lowered his voice further. He's too gullible. In short, Tucker didn't trust James's judgment. Smiling, Bessie seemed to be in a good mood. You're right. How about this? Do you and our uncle have time tonight? Tucker was shocked. Bessie? I want to talk about the variety show with him. Bessie glanced at the students coming in one after another. I'll hang up first. On the other end of the line, Tucker stared at his phone in disbelief. After a long while, he sent a message. Bessie, are you going to meet our uncle? In the library, Bessie went to the bookshelf and found two books. When she saw Tucker's message, she replied, her expression distasteful. Yes. Bessie's schedule was packed that day, and she had her last lesson at 5.30 p.m. Not many people were outside the school at this time. She didn't return to her bedroom to change her clothes. Walking outside with her backpack, she easily grabbed a taxi at the school gate. She checked the address sent by Tucker and gave it to the taxi driver. They finally stopped outside a quiet restaurant. Not far away, Michael and Patrick were walking down the street. Patrick was talking to someone on the phone when he noticed that Michael had stopped in his tracks, as if he had seen something strange. Michael? He also paused and glanced in the same direction, but saw nothing. Taking out a cigarette, Michael snorted softly, and his eyebrows drooped expressionlessly. It's nothing. Let's go. Patrick nodded and continued reporting his work over the phone. Absent-mindedly, Michael bit his cigarette but didn't light it. He took out his phone and unlocked it with his bony fingers. After a long while, he sent a message. What are you doing? Upstairs inside the restaurant, Tucker was playing games with headphones on. He was with Zeke and his manager in a private room. After finding out who he was meeting tonight, the manager lowered his voice and said, Zeke, you're too impulsive. This Anne is obviously scheming. If she knows that you're her uncle, she'll definitely try to take advantage of you. This wouldn't have any substantial impact on Zeke, but it would certainly be disgusting. The manager had read through the information given to Zeke last night. Many people like Anne existed in the entertainment industry. James had been working in hard labor and had never witnessed what Anne did. She was living in the Smith family's house as if she had forgotten her father's existence. Of course, such people were very common in reality. Her mother, for example, seemed similar. It's going to be big trouble if she really wants to enter the entertainment industry at this time. The manager sighed. Zeke's Spotless history might now be stained by Anne from now on. Zeke poured a glass of wine for the manager, his demeanor gentle and elegant. Don't jump to conclusions. It might be better than you imagine. He glanced at Tucker and pondered the possibilities. The manager cautiously glanced at him, then nodded and stopped trying to persuade him. Then you have to prepare to be used. He also needed to prepare for future PR content. At this time, Tucker took off his headphones and stood up. My sister is here. Zeke and his manager turned to look at Tucker. Where is she? Zeke stood up and looked down. Putting the earphones away, Tucker looked out the door with shining eyes. Downstairs. It was obvious he liked this sister very much. No hurry. Zeke chuckled. She'll arrive soon. The manager glanced at the door and frowned. Having only Anne's information, he had a headache and felt worried after hearing Tucker say that his sister was coming. Three knocks sounded on the door. At this moment, it was too late to persuade Zeke. The manager dragged his feet to open the door. The manager had followed Zeke for many years, even witnessing him opening his own studio and beginning to sign new artists. 
As a manager, he was on the constant lookout for potential newcomers. At first glance, he always looked at the person's appearance, temperament, and unique characteristics. From Anne's photo last night, she had the style of a pretty daughter of a humble family. Her appearance would be considered adequate in the entertainment industry, but it was still a little lacking compared to Zeke. The entertainment industry had no shortage of beauties. Putting Anne's face in the entertainment industry wouldn't even make a splash. Knowing this as well as her attitude, the manager opened the door with complicated feelings. Zeke. He looked up and was about to speak, but when he saw Bessie's face, he swallowed his words back inside. Instead of Anne standing at the door, it was a tall girl with long hair casually draped over her shoulders. Her skin was snow white and her eyes were downcast. When she heard him, she slightly raised an eyebrow, her thin lips casually curling. She exuded an inexplicable sense of evil tendencies. The manager stared at Bessie with eyes that had seen many beauties. Perhaps because the difference from Anne was so great, he didn't dare connect the person in front of him with Tucker's sister. He just uttered blankly, who are you looking for? Glancing at the message she had just received on her phone, she raised an eyebrow and replied after a while, I'm Bessie. I'm looking for Tucker. Her reply was extremely concise and clear. Oh, come in, please. The manager hurriedly turned sideways and stepped aside, but he was still stunned inside. Wasn't it Anne who was supposed to come? Who was Bessie? Bessie. Tucker stood up and was about to pull on her sleeves. Bessie glanced at him. Sit down. Tucker immediately retracted his hand and sat back down. Then he introduced Zeke to her. Bessie, this is our uncle. Then he turned his head and said with his chin slightly raised, Uncle, this is my sister, Bessie. Zeke had felt some suspicions after receiving the information last night, but although he had already suspected it, he was still very surprised to see Bessie in person. From Tucker's tone, he could detect his affection for her. Glancing at him, he chuckled softly. Yes, I'm Zeke Miller, your uncle. He told me that you're here to discuss his appearance in the district's reality show. Bessie sat down and first sent a message to Michael. She nodded absentmindedly. Tucker couldn't decipher her attitude, but at least she didn't leave straight away. He just bowed his head and took a sip of his drink. Zeke had only just decided to bring Tucker to the variety show, so naturally, no contract had been signed yet. But there was an electronic version of it, which he asked his manager to show Bessie. Taking out his phone, the manager found the contract and showed it to her. She took it and looked through the document. The contract was 12 pages in total. She scrolled for a little more than a minute and then returned the phone to the manager. You're done? The manager was shocked. Yeah. Between a glass of juice and a glass of boiled water, she picked up the ladder and tapped on the glass with her hand. Desolate island? Isn't it dangerous? Zeke squinted slightly and thought for a while. They only say it's possible. The show will be broadcasted for three episodes and only one episode will be on the deserted island. We'll basically experience life in scenic areas, but there'll be doctors and helicopters on standby. Bessie rested her hand on her chin and asked several more questions. They were all about issues mentioned in the contract. While listening, the manager felt increasingly puzzled. After checking on his phone, sure enough, he found all the things that had prompted Bessie's questions in the contract. He looked up at her very surprised. He thought she had casually flipped through it, but he didn't expect her to have looked through it so seriously. The program group has many challenges. Tucker is smart. I can bask in his light by bringing him along. Zeke reached out to pour more juice into Tucker's cup. Bessie hadn't actually come to check the contract. Several celebrities would be on the variety show, so they wouldn't dare to put the guests in danger. She mainly wanted to test Zeke and found that he indeed planned to look out for Tucker. He was much more reliable than James. After gaining this understanding, Bessie stopped talking. Bessie, you... Tucker had already finished his meal, 
Seeing Bessie put down her fork, he wanted her to look at his game. Bessie didn't even lift her head. No, I don't know how to do it. Tucker looked down and stammered miserably. Oh. The manager on the side hurriedly said, Tucker, what game is it? Let me help you. Tucker handed the phone to him. The game had progressed halfway through. Not taking children's games seriously, the manager clicked on the start button. After a few seconds, pop, his game character died. Startled, he started again. Pop, his game character died again. After repeating this several times, he silently handed the phone back to Tucker. Tucker took it expectantly. Having finished her meal, Bessie glanced at the time and was about to head back. Zeke also put down his fork and went downstairs with her. Where do you live? We'll drive you back. It was past seven o'clock now, nearing eight o'clock. Zeke didn't know what Bessie did or where she lived. He only heard Jack mention that she was a student studying at the local university. At this time of day, he naturally wouldn't let her go back alone. No need. Bessie stood at the intersection and glanced around. She spotted a black car not far away. Someone is waiting for me. She put her phone in her pocket and walked diagonally across the road. She waved back to him as she went. Zeke stood there, watching Bessie get into the car. Only after the car drove away did he look away. The manager beside him took a glance at the license plate number, wanting to write it down in case Bessie met with any danger. But while reading it, he felt something strange. This license plate number. Wasn't it too arrogant? Episode 285 This sister isn't like the other sister. Zeke called James again. Tucker was still staying with him tonight. After returning home, the manager dared to ask, Zeke, what's the deal with this Bessie? My brother has two daughters, Zeke replied. He took a cup and poured a glass of lemonade. Clearing his throat, he leaned on the water dispenser and laughed. I only checked on Anne, but Tucker wasn't talking about her. In the car with the arrogant license plate, Bessie sat in the back seat while Patrick drove in front. Resting her cheek in one hand and putting her elbow on the window, she glanced at Patrick. Why is it you? Where's Marvin? Patrick glanced at the rearview mirror and respectfully replied, I came out today to discuss business with Michael, so we picked you up. Marvin went to visit Mary. Bessie counted the days. Marvin was probably meeting Mary about the flower. She tapped on the car window and turned to look at Michael. When did he go? I have something to tell Mary. He just left. Michael finally opened his eyes and glanced at her, his tone light. It's not too late to go now. Understanding his meaning, Patrick turned on his phone and Bluetooth at the red light. He dialed Marvin's phone and asked for the address. Marvin replied with an address a ways away from Northwestern University. It took more than an hour to drive there. Not many people were on the road at this moment, and it wasn't the holiday either, so the road wasn't very congested. They stopped at the intersection Marvin had sent them. Marvin had just arrived. Not many pedestrians were out and about. Miss Miller, Michael. Marvin greeted them as he saw them coming out from the back door of the car. Patrick glanced around and didn't see anyone else. Has Mary come yet? She's arriving now. Marvin glanced in one direction. This was where he traded with Mary every time. In less than two minutes, a van slowly drove towards the side of the road and then stopped. Mary got out of the car holding a flower pot. After handing it to Marvin, she ran to Bessie and whispered, Bessie, why didn't you tell me you were coming? Before Bessie could reply, Mary clapped a hand to her forehead. By the way, our cat, Mimi, is here too. Folding her arms, Bessie raised her chin. Let me see. Mary opened the door of the back seat. Mary's father took out the car key and got out of the driver's seat. He couldn't help but exhort. Mary, be careful. So many people are here. Don't scare them. At the thought of the very miserable cat in Mary's house, Marvin sympathetically glanced over. Mary was holding a black rope in her hand. 
Looking from Bessie's side, Marvin could see that the rope was a bit thick with a cold metallic luster. While standing next to Bessie, he stared at the rope in surprise. Such a thick rope? Was this necessary for a cat? Mimi, come down! Mary whistled and a huge figure suddenly jumped out of the back seat. Both sensing the danger, Marvin and Patrick instinctively took a step back. Squinting, Michael reached out to grab Bessie and pull her to his side. As if sensing Michael's gaze, Mimi didn't dare to pounce forward. Mimi, sit down, Mary ordered. The black shadow prowling at the end of the rope stopped and then sat in front of Mary imposingly. This is Mimi? Marvin stared at Mary and Mimi blankly. Patting Mimi's head, Mary smiled happily. Yeah, what's wrong? Marvin was speechless. No, it was fine to joke that your dog was a cat, but why did they give a nearly three-foot-tall Tibetan Mastiff the name Mimi? Even sitting next to Mary, the Tibetan Mastiff was nearly three feet tall, with a pure black mane on its body that faintly reflected the cold light. His bark was dull, his head resembled a lion, and his bright, expressive eyes were slightly tinged with gold. The fine hair on his powerful claws danced about in the wind in a flurry. He was fierce and menacing. People passing by desperately wanted to be at least a kilometer away from him. Bessie, what do you think of Mimi? Mary was eager to know Bessie's opinion. Bessie touched her chin and nodded slowly. He's fine. You raised him pretty well. While talking, she took out a casually folded ticket from her pocket and stuffed it directly into Mary's pocket. What's this? She took it out from her pocket. Her head aching, Bessie waved her away. Bye. Returning to his senses, Patrick glanced at Marvin and whispered, Are all of Miss Miller's friends like this? Marvin took the flower pot handed over by Mary's father. Hearing this, he glanced at Patrick silently. Brother, don't you remember the mercenary suddenly barbecuing obediently in the middle of a fight? Marvin patted Patrick on the shoulder, then carefully carried the flower pot to the car trunk. Bessie returned to the car after talking to Mary and the others. Miss Miller, where are you going? Patrick sat in the driver's seat and turned the car on. Looking down at the time on her phone, she saw that it was already past nine o'clock. Back to the Highline Apartments. Although there were regulations for returning to the dormitory, Dean Soup was very lenient towards Bessie. Sitting beside her with his lips slightly pursed, Michael silently turned towards her. He held his phone in one hand and his head in the other, looking a little distracted. His phone showed a conversation. What are you doing? Meeting someone. It didn't matter if that was the case. Michael scrolled down the conversation and saw Bessie's second, later reply. He looks more handsome in person. Appearance was power. After thinking for a while, Michael took out a cigarette from his pocket. Instead of lighting it, he just pinched it between his teeth. They arrived at the Highline Apartments. Patrick stopped the car at the gate. Michael and Bessie got out of the car while Patrick drove the car into the underground parking lot. Bessie lowered her head and followed unhurriedly behind Michael. She was still thinking of the Miller family. Michael pressed the elevator button. It needed time to come down from the 21st floor, so he glanced sideways at her and cleared his throat. Who is it? Unable to comprehend his question, Bessie leaned against the wall. What? That... Michael glanced at her and lazily said, The person you said was handsome. The elevator arrived with a ding. As the two of them entered it, Bessie casually replied, Zeke, the superstar. Zeke? Michael repeated the name once and suddenly remembered something. Looking down at her, his eyes narrowed and he suddenly chuckled slowly after a while. Once inside the elevator, he kept thinking about it. Zeke. Without checking, Michael had guessed from James's recent words that he was probably the Miller family's lost child from years ago. Bessie was unaware of the undulation in Michael's mood. 
she just took out her phone and opened a game. She turned on the screen recording function, but before she could play the game Tucker had sent her through the hidden software, a phone call suddenly appeared at the top of her screen. It was Principal White, whom she hadn't talked to for more than a year. Ding! The elevator door opened. While walking out, she picked up the call. Michael followed behind her, with her black backpack. Principal White had just got on the plane in Austria. Wearing reading glasses, his eyes looked extremely sharp behind the lenses. When the phone was connected, he smiled and glanced at Austria's landscape out the window. Bessie, I'll arrive in Evanston tomorrow, he said gently. At the same time, at Zeke's house, Jack was giving Zeke a copy of some information, his expression slightly strange. Zeke, I found James's daughter. Previously, he had no intention of finding the two daughters after retrieving James, but he had started the investigation after being prompted by Zeke. Zeke took the document in surprise. Jack showed him the information and couldn't help but exclaim, his daughter is at Northwestern University, attending the art department. It turned out to be much better than I thought. Jack had printed the information out, which wasn't particularly detailed and only filled one piece of paper. It showed Anne's photo and a general introduction to her current situation. It wasn't as detailed as Zeke's. Glancing at it casually, Zeke threw Jack's information on the table, then leaned against the sofa his expression unclear. He was thinking about Bessie. As for Anne, after reading 129's information, he didn't really fancy her. But Bessie? Although she didn't talk much, and he didn't know what she did since there wasn't much information on her, he still felt inexplicably close to her. Maybe it was because Tucker liked this sister very much. Zeke, what do you think? Jack couldn't figure out what Zeke thought, and subconsciously lowered his voice. Should I send someone to pick her up? Jack's information network wasn't as powerful as Zeke's. For many years, most of the Miller family's power had been swallowed up by the fourth son and the Flake family. Jack could only find out a little about Anne in such a short time. Tucker's door opened and he came in to get some water while wearing small slippers. Temporarily set this matter aside. Standing up, Zeke stopped talking about Anne and walked over to Tucker to help him get a glass of warm water. Have you taken care of the headquarters? I heard you snatched a project. He asked Jack. I couldn't find out who edited the project. I asked Keith to take a look at the surveillance footage, and he's still looking at the three days footage. Speaking of this, Jack frowned. When Tucker took the water that Zeke handed him and heard this, his eyebrows flashed. Thank you, he whispered to Zeke and then entered his room. Zeke had installed a huge screen for him. It was a screen that projected the game he was playing. Instead of taking his mouse immediately, he picked up his laptop from the bed. After opening the editor, he entered a line of code and then pressed enter. A firewall popped up. Putting his chin on his hand, he placed the laptop on his lap and stared at the editor page in confusion. After a long while, he sighed. He put the computer aside and slowly went to get his cell phone from where he'd thrown it on the bed. He clicked on Twitter, found Bessie's profile, and sent a message. Jack is watching the elevator surveillance for the three days of Thanksgiving break. Episode 286, Appearance is Power At Zeke's apartment, the manager came in with a variety show contract. Zeke, Tucker's contract is ready. Are you signing for him? Are you sure you want to take Tucker to a variety show? Jack was a little surprised. Yesterday morning, the manager had been against this, but now he had prepared the contract? Yeah, he'll join the team at the end of next month. Zeke walked over, glanced at the contract, and then signed on the last page with a black pen. How long will it take? Jack suddenly thought of something. He still has to attend school. I've already asked him. 
Zeke wasn't concerned. Jack nodded. Zeke had arranged everything, so he didn't need to worry much. He mainly had come to talk about Anne today. Standing up with the document, he continued. James said that he has two daughters, but I can't find information about the other one. I heard from him that she never lived with him and always lived with her grandma. I wonder how she turned out. After all, when they first found James, he had been in a terrible situation, moving bricks on a construction site. Anne's information had comforted Jack a little, as it was much better than he had first expected. As for James's other daughter, Jack didn't know what she was like, and how she was compared to Anne. That's right. Zeke snapped his fingers and lifted his chin to the manager. Bring the files from my study. Knowing what information he was talking about, the manager quickly handed the printed information on Anne to Jack. Only when Jack left did he turn to look at Zeke. Zeke rubbed his eyebrows. What is it? Does your niece have any intention of entering the entertainment industry? The manager walked over to him. Look at her face. She was born to be in this industry. It just so happens that your studio wants to sign a newbie. What's better than putting your niece under your nose? The manager was naturally talking about Bessie. With your status in the entertainment industry and your large number of resources, she won't be dragged to messy banquets and will have you covering for her. From then on, the two of you will sweep the domestic entertainment circle. Imagining this scene as he spoke, he flushed with excitement and reached out to pat the table. Zeke tapped his fingers on the sofa and glanced at him. It depends on the situation. You can do what you like if you can convince her to enter the entertainment industry. He just felt like Bessie didn't seem the type to want to enter the entertainment industry. With her looks, she couldn't have not been approached by scouts before. In fact, he thought of the car he saw that night. The manager stood up, his face filled with joy. Then give me her contact information. Instead of giving it to him, Zeke lightly said, Go to Tucker for it. Taking out his phone, he clicked on Bessie's saved contact and stared at it for a long time before opening Twitter and flipping through the Ad Friends page. Quickly, he found her contact number and clicked on it. The avatar was blank and nothing was written on her profile. He neatly filled two words in the verification message. Zeke Miller. Jack had already returned to the Miller family's old house. He was looking at the information in his room now. Outside, Keith knocked on the door. Putting down his reading glasses, Jack said in a deep voice, Come in. Jack. Keith walked over, and when he saw the documents on the desk, his eyes shook slightly, and his voice almost broke. 129's information? How did you obtain it? On the information page that Zeke had printed, the lower right corner held 129's emblem. After being in the Miller family's house for so long, of course, Keith knew Evanston's forces. The previous year, the Miller family hadn't been so severely split, and there had been more than a dozen programmers in the family. But in the last year, the fourth son had managed to break the Miller family one by one in that short time. It was mostly because Sherry was a member of 129 and found a lot of internal information about the Miller family. The fourth son was such an unscrupulous person. It only made sense that the Miller family declined under his hands. The four major families all wanted to annex the emerging power, 129. But forget anyone else. Lone Wolf and Giant Crocodile alone would deter all the forces from stepping beyond the prescribed limit. Zeke gave me this information on Anne. Jack put down the documents. Noticing his strange expression, Keith glanced up involuntarily. What's wrong? Jack sneered. She's fastidious, but incompetent. She almost unilaterally broke off the father-daughter relationship with James. Since she wants to be rid of us, just leave her alone. Nodding, Keith glanced at the documents at the side and remembered why he was looking for Jack. I've looked through the surveillance of James's apartment. What did you find? Jack stood up with his hands on the table. 
You'll know when you see it. Keith didn't know what to say, and his expression was a little weird. Putting aside the matter at hand, Jack followed Keith to Ricky's room to take a look. The video was being processed there. When Ricky saw Jack, he directly opened the two-minute surveillance video without a word. Jack finished looking at it and noticed some people coming and going. Which one? He asked Ricky. After a moment of silence, Ricky lowered his head and pointed his finger to the time on the monitor. Look again. The time was displayed above the surveillance video. Taking a closer look, Jack saw the problem. On Thanksgiving Day, two minutes of each surveillance, from 11 a.m. and 8 p.m., had been skipped. When I first got it, the total video duration was 36 hours, but just now, there was a sudden loss of four minutes. Ricky glanced at the computer with an unpredictable expression. Jack, someone has hacked me under my nose. I've yet to find the deleted video. Although Ricky wasn't a professional hacker, he was still a senior programmer of the Miller Corporation. His hacking level wasn't comparable to that of Masters, but he was still much better than ordinary people. He had built up firewalls on his computer by himself. Someone had tampered with the data on his firewall and taken the opportunity to delete the video. Who could do this? Jack, the other party is probably a very powerful hacker. Ricky looked up expectantly. If he could help us. Sitting across from him, Jack asked. But how could James know such a person? Jack couldn't understand it. It wasn't that he looked down on James. But given his living environment, he didn't look like someone who would know such people. Realizing the countless riddles waiting to be answered, his head started aching. The next day on Northwestern University's campus, Anne came out of class holding a pile of books and saw Kenneth standing there. She was stunned. Ever since the final exams, she had not seen Kenneth, nor had he looked for her. Thus, the two had almost lost contact. She hadn't heard from him after coming to Northwestern University, which was when she realized he wasn't schooling here. Standing there holding the books, she thought for a while before walking to him. Kenny, why are you here? If it had been a month ago, she wouldn't have been so passionate about him. But now? She pursed her lips slightly, putting his hands in his pockets. Kenneth glanced at the crowd and paused when he heard her. He nodded slightly at her and replied, I'm waiting for Paul. By the way, which school did you apply to? Anne nodded. I didn't apply to college. Having seen Paul, Kenneth waved at him and spoke calmly in a clear tone. My grandpa didn't let me continue studying. You're not going to college? Anne looked a little stunned. She raised her head and glanced at him before smiling reluctantly. Kenny, are you lying to me? What was he doing if he wasn't attending college? I'm really not studying anymore. With Paul a few steps away, Kenneth glanced at Anne and said, We're going to eat. Do you want to come? She shook her head, a little afraid of Paul, especially after Bessie's incident. No, Kenneth didn't say much. He had always been cold. And after so many months of not seeing him, she thought he seemed to have changed a lot. After he left, Anne's classmate of the same major came over and asked her who the boy was just now. He's so handsome, he's comparable to our school heartthrob, Luke. He's not from our school, is he? He's not. Anne smiled. After the incident, she had asked the counselor to change her dormitory. He scored 732 in the final exams and ranked second in the nation. There were sounds of exclamation all around, but she glanced at Kenneth's back and pursed her lips. She didn't know if Paul would tell him what happened on the internet. In Bessie's bedroom, Kara noticed that her potted flower was different today, but Bessie was wearing headphones and writing some music that she didn't understand. After finishing the homework set by the professor, Kara turned on the computer and asked if anyone in the class wanted to play games together. Not long after that, 
Denora, who was rarely around these days, came back. She put the bag on her desk and glanced at Kara and Alyssa. Do you know that your department is having a lecture tomorrow? Letting go of the keyboard, Kara's eyes lit up. Are you talking about our school heartthrob, Luke? Of course, she sighed, but I couldn't get a ticket. Northwestern University's lecture hall was only so big and couldn't fit everyone in the science and technology department. It wouldn't have been a problem if it was someone else, but it just had to be Luke, who moved in and out with wizardly elusiveness. It was not just the science and technology department's students, but students from the other departments as well, who were frantically rushing for tickets. Although the lecture was originally intended for the science and technology department's new students, that group of students couldn't grab their share in the end. In fact, out of all the students of different years and majors, the science and technology department students fared the worst in the end. Their tickets were few and far between. Kara now recognized the terror of fanaticism. Episode 287 Bessie Continues to Meet Her Friends My seniors happen to know Luke. Denora smiled. You know Luke? Kara kicked her legs excitedly. Have you seen him in person? Sitting down on her chair, Denora glanced at Bessie after handing the tickets to Kara. She was still wearing headphones, as if she hadn't heard them. I've met him once. I'll bring you guys along the next time I have a chance. Bessie's phone was playing songs and the headphones were specially made so that she couldn't hear background noise. A phone call came in at this time. Glancing at it, she hung up instead of picking up and then got up. Kara glanced at her. Wait, Bessie, are you going to eat? Let's go together. She followed her with her meal card. Bessie glanced at her and then held up her phone. I am, but I'm meeting a few friends. Who? Following Bessie downstairs, Kara slowed down when she heard Bessie was going to see her friends. Although she was close to Bessie, she still felt embarrassed since she didn't know these friends. Or I could eat by myself, she started to say. Bessie raised an eyebrow. They're schoolmates. Let's go, they're in the cafeteria. How many? Kara followed her. Three... Stopping at the vending machine on the first floor of Canteen 8, Bessie threw a few coins in and then took out two cans of Coke. All three of Bessie's friends had passed the Northwestern University examination. Kara didn't know what to expect from Bessie's friends. Could this be a legendary gathering of birds of a feather? Bessie threw a can of Coke to Kara, holding her phone and the other Coke in one hand. Without putting her phone back into her pocket, she opened the tab and took a sip. Holding the can of Coke, Kara followed her to the third floor. Students went to Canteen 8's first and second floors to collect their meals, while the third floor was for ordering a la carte, which was much more expensive per person. At 5 o'clock, before the normal afternoon peak hours, not many people were on the third floor. There were only a few people at the tables. Kara looked around. Where are your friends? Casually shaking the can of Coke, Bessie lifted her chin towards the table next to the farthest window. There, although short-sighted, Kara could still see the two figures sitting there clearly. She and Bessie arrived at the table within two minutes. Bessie, you came right on the dot again. Holding a cigarette, Brian didn't dare to light it. He crossed his arms and leaned back in his chair. He didn't have the air of stability that Mr. Grint exuded, and the expression on his handsome face was unruly and reckless. Sitting across from him, Scarlet was the complete opposite. Hello. He held out his hand when he saw Kara behind Bessie. I'm Brian from the other school. Bessie sat down on the iron chair. My roommate, Kara. The three introduced themselves, one after the other. Returning to her senses, Kara sat down beside Bessie and let out a sigh of relief. They were indeed Bessie's friends, and all of them were very good-looking. Anyone who could talk to Bessie, who had such a bad temper, could certainly get along with Brian and the others. Scarlet was rather quiet, so it was mostly Brian talking to Kara. 
Bessie leaned back and drank the Coke. Bessie said that there's three of you. Kara scanned the room, remembering what Bessie said just now. Luke went to order the dishes. He's more familiar with Northwestern University than us. Brian put down his fork and gestured behind Kara. He's coming. Kara instinctively turned around. Brian was very popular at the University of Chicago, but he wasn't from their school, after all. Kara was also a new student and didn't know much. Scarlett was always alternating between the library, dormitory, or classroom. In Northwestern University's vast world, she wasn't as expectation-defying as she had been in Brightbow High School and was only slightly famous in her department. But Luke was different. His popularity could be understood from how quickly the tickets for today were snatched up. As the first person in Northwestern University to be able to enter the laboratory at the beginning of their sophomore semester, the school forum was boasting of his glorious events even today. After so many days in the university, Kara finally knew how important the laboratory was. If a student from Northwestern University wanted to enter the laboratory, it was about the same difficulty as a student from an ordinary high school wanting to enter Northwestern University. Other than the midterm and final exams, standards had to be met for other assessments as well. Kara had been amazed by the leaked assessment questions in the school forum. As expected, the laboratory wasn't a place that ordinary people could enter. And Luke? He was a godlike person, not just to Kara, but to the entire Northwestern University student body. His indisputable figure was more popular than the top 100 popular girls. News of Luke entering the laboratory had blown up among the seniors this year, and he had become famous in one foul swoop. In the first semester of his freshman year, he had lived in seclusion, so not many people knew him. Therefore, when Kara saw Luke coming over with a tray, she sat very still on her stool and thought she was daydreaming. I'm Luke, a sophomore in the physics department, said Luke calmly, sitting down next to Brian and taking out the fork from inside the bowl. He handed the tray to Brian and asked him to pick up the remaining dishes. Kara responded stiffly to his greeting, then held her fork stiffly, and just as stiffly pulled the tab of the Coke bottle. To her side, Bessie replied on behalf of Kara. She might be your fan. She just got two tickets and is over the moon. Luke chuckled. The tickets outside are basically backstage tickets. Brian served the dishes one by one. I came to talk to you about the midterm exam. Luke said, looking up at Bessie soberly. Bessie wasn't very bothered. Why? Don't do it. Luke calmly picked up his fork while glancing at her. I mean the Morse code. The same goes for the final exam. After a pause, he said again, Maybe we can't wait until the final exam. I wouldn't do it even without your advice. I promised Dean Soup to take the exam properly. Reaching out to flick the strand of hair that had slid over her eyes, Bessie calmly replied, But is the midterm exam? That important? Bessie still didn't understand the laboratory's rules. She had focused only on her nuclear engineering textbooks. Yes, the selection of candidates for the science and technology department's participation in the laboratory is based on performance. The laboratory has serious divisions now. Before the next resource allocation, President Flores will probably put you there. He probably already signed you up for this year's assessment. Luke solemnly glanced at the vivid sunlight outside the window. He could guess President Flores' intentions without thinking. Bessie put her chin in her hand. What do you mean? There are three major laboratories. The medical laboratory is at Northwestern University. The science and technology laboratory is at the junction between Northwestern University and the IT laboratory is at the University of Chicago. He looked at her again. The laboratory consists of not just students from Northwestern University, but also from the University of Chicago. Of course, the powers of Devil City have basically been assimilated by Northwestern University and the University of Chicago. 
both of which are competing for the number of placements in the research institutes. If President Flores signed you up, the first round of screening will be your midterm exam. Nodding, Bessie turned the fork in her hand. I see. Luke just casually mentioned this, unaware that Bessie valued what he deemed as important so much that she paid more attention to the midterm exam now than she previously had to the final exam. Having not seen each other for a long time, they continued chatting for a while after finishing their meals. It wasn't until 5.30 p.m. when more students got off of class that the crowd gradually increased and they left. On the way back to the bedroom, Kara was silent. She seemed deep in thought. What's wrong with you? Alyssa asked when they entered. Staring at the two tickets for Luke's speech on the table, Kara looked up. Oh, I'm okay. I'm just thinking about something. Luke returned to the laboratory. A middle-aged man in a lab coat came in hurriedly. How did it go? Has she agreed to be my apprentice? Slowly putting on a lab coat, Luke buttoned it up and answered expressionlessly. I asked. She's not willing. The middle-aged man wiped his bald head with an incomprehensible expression. That can't be. How could she not agree to be my apprentice? Impossible. Walking past with his hands full of experimental equipment, Jerome glanced at the professor sleepily and sympathetically. Jerome had dark circles under his eyes. Didn't he know that Luke's friend couldn't be mentioned? Jerome had just spoken casually about her once, and he hadn't closed his eyes for three days. Luke finished putting on his coat and suddenly remembered something. Jerome, do you still have tickets to the talk? Jerome was jolted awake. Of course, I have the VIP Supreme tickets. Luke, what are your instructions? Get some tickets for my friend Bessie. Jerome's eyes lit up. Okay, I'll send them over to Bessie. In the second basement of the laboratory, the person in charge was checking the list of applicants for this year. Two examinations were held in the Science and Technology Laboratory every year at the end of March and early December, respectively. Each exam must be registered for in advance. The registration for the early December exam ended today, and the person in charge had just received the list submitted by Northwestern University's President Flores. A new student. He felt stunned at the sight of Bessie's name. Hearing this, the assistant beside him turned and leaned over. Could they have made a mistake? I'll ask the professor at Northwestern University. Three minutes later, she returned with the phone. The person in charge pushed his glasses and asked, So? President Flores personally confirmed that this list is correct. The assistant responded and then put the phone back in his pocket. Episode 288 The Opening of a Good Show Instead of worrying further about this, the person in charge just typed Bessie's name into the list and pondered out loud. President Flores is very confident this year. It'll probably be another good show. Northwestern University had done a similar thing before and reported a freshman name, Luke, who had shown off his brilliance in the laboratory. At that time, the laboratory had made several calls before confirming that Northwestern University's president hadn't given the wrong name. But Luke's name had at least been reported at the end of March. It was only December and the overall class time new students had received was less than half of what Luke had been given when he took the exam. What was Northwestern University doing? When Alyssa came out of the bathroom at the Northwestern University girls' dormitory, Bessie's table was already empty. She went to the library again? Alyssa asked with a lower voice. Wasn't she too hardworking? Other than during bedtime, Alyssa hardly saw Bessie all day. Lifting her head from the textbook, Kara slightly frowned. Yeah, her midterm exam is the computer science exam. A double degree program is difficult. Northwestern University's subjects were difficult and it already wasn't easy to complete a major. Thus, double degree majors naturally had to work harder than ordinary people. Opposite, Denora had finished packing her books and was putting on earrings while looking in the mirror. 
Hearing this, she turned her head and said, She still hasn't given up on the double degree? No, Kara checked her watch. There was an open class tonight, so she put away her book. Suddenly remembering something, she turned to look at Denora. Denora, do you have tickets? My class representative wants them. Your class representative? Denora finished with her earrings and started putting on her lipstick. Gary, Kara propped her hand on the back of the chair. Denora paused while applying her lipstick. Geniuses from all over the country were gathered at Northwestern University. It wasn't easy for new students to make a name for themselves unless they were very good-looking like Bessie, who had godly visuals and had shot to fame during military training. As for the other new students, not many were outstanding. But Denora knew of Gary. He was Evanston's top scorer for the final exams, with a score of 728. He had even been on the news for several days after the release of the results. Having perfected her lipstick, Denora took her book and glanced at Kara. I don't have class tonight. Coincidentally, I'll go to the open class with you guys. In Northwestern University's student union office, the president was in a meeting with the ministers and vice ministers of various departments. Two knocks sounded on the door. Jerome opened the door and entered in a hurry. He had yet to change out of his lab coat that night. The president of the student union quickly got up. President Jerome, why are you here? Jerome was the student union's previous president. Glancing around, he asked, Do you still have my tickets here? The reason why the student union had tickets to Luke's talk was solely because of Jerome. Yes? The president hurriedly stopped the meeting and stood up to take Jerome to the office. He opened the drawer and pulled out the tickets. There are four tickets left. Jerome glanced at them and saw that they were second-row tickets. That's fine. He reached out for them. Holding the tickets, he didn't converse further with the president and just flipped through the information on his phone with his head lowered. Bessie's dormitory address was written on his phone. It was almost 9 p.m. and the street lights on the campus had gradually turned on. Jerome pressed on his bicycle's handbrakes and called Bessie to ask where she was. She was still in the library. Many people were inside, and the library assistant would normally clear your space if the seat was empty for more than 20 minutes, so Bessie didn't go down to meet him. Putting down her pen, she took her phone to the outdoor balcony and called Kara. Where are you? She asked while casually leaning against the wall. Kara gave her an address. Recalling the map of Northwestern University in her mind, Bessie realized she was very close and touched her chin thoughtfully. Wait there a few minutes, I'm going to ask my classmate to pass you something. On the other end of the phone, Kara and the others had just left the teaching building. The people from Kai's dormitory were enthusiastically chatting with Denora. You're from the software engineering department, but you can still get two tickets. Our department's seniors didn't even save any for the new students. I just happen to know a senior who knows the previous president. Smiling lightly, Denora glanced at Gary, who was walking behind them with his hands in his pocket. Kara doesn't even talk about Bessie. Denora, do you know what she does all day? The boys in Kai's dormitory were obviously more interested in Bessie. Denora's smile remained unchanged. She probably went to see her boyfriend. I think her boyfriend has already graduated a long time ago, and is a member of high society, so he doesn't appear on campus often boyfriend? Kai's roommate immediately beat his chest in dismay. After a long while, he recovered and sighed. Sure enough, beautiful women are always taken. Denora maintained her smile without saying anything. While walking in front, Kara hung up the phone and said very apologetically, I'm sorry, I have to wait for Bessie's classmate. You guys can head back first. It doesn't matter, it won't take long, Kai said and the others immediately said that they could wait together. He glanced at Gary, who also nodded, so they stood there waiting for Bessie's classmate. Within a few minutes, Jerome saw Kara. At a glance, he recognized the girl with a fair-skinned baby face who was wearing a white t-shirt and blue denim hot pants. He squeezed his bicycle's handbrake and placed his feet on the ground. You're Bessie Miller's roommate? Yes, hello. Kara politely greeted him. 
As the member of the student union, Denora had seen the photos at the student union's office and recognized him as their last president, Jerome Childs. Glancing at her, Jerome didn't recognize her and just nodded very perfunctorily. Hello, this is what Luke wants to pass to Bessie. He took out a few tickets from his pocket and handed them to Kara. I have matters to attend to, so I'll head back now. Those who could enter Northwestern University weren't ordinary people. Although Jerome was very ordinary compared to Luke's resume, he was still considered extremely good compared to other people. As the student union president and a member of the laboratory, he had the right to be proud. Other than Kara, whom Bessie told him about, he didn't bother greeting the others. After exchanging phone numbers with Kara, he left on his bicycle. He rushed back to sleep. From his clothes, it was very obvious that he was from the laboratory. His life was the dream of countless people in Northwestern University's school forum. After hearing Jerome mention Luke, Kara was rather calm when receiving the tickets. Glancing at Bessie's Twitter message, she turned to Gary. Bessie has four tickets, but she's not going. I'll give them to you guys. The boys in the class had taken good care of the only two girls in their class ever since the military training and were very close to them, so Kara wasn't overly formal with them. Staring at Jerome's back, Kai confirmed his suspicions with her. Kara, was that the senior from the laboratory just now? Yeah, Kara calmly replied. Denora also stared after Jerome, and her feelings were extremely complicated. First, it had been the World Poker Tour's computer. She originally thought that Bessie's boyfriend who had stepped into society had helped her. But what about Jerome now? She pursed her lips involuntarily. Bessie's methods were really not to be underestimated. Instead of going to Luke's speech, Bessie spent her time either in the library or in the nuclear engineering classroom. Apart from bedtime, even Kara rarely saw her. It was Saturday. There weren't any open classes or electives, and the library was closed. Both Alyssa and Kara were in the bedroom. Kara saw that Bessie was very busy, but she still wanted to pull her to play games every day. Other than her, Bessie's high school class also felt the same way. Looking up from the music score she was working on, Bessie said with a throbbing head, Wait, I'll put you into the game group. Kara regretfully nodded. She had a lot of groups, so adding another one didn't matter. Okay, put me in. Bessie found the group built by Paul and her high school classmates, then put Kara into it. She chatted privately with Paul and asked him to verify her. On the other end of the message, Paul received Bessie's news. Hearing that Kara was Bessie's roommate and had even been introduced to this group, he immediately went to verify her. After he taked Kara and the people in the group all saw that she had been invited by Bessie, they basically lined up to welcome her and even made an appointment to play games together. The group was very joyful, so Kara also added them casually. Slightly unaccustomed to the enthusiasm, she said a few words, then opened the group information to take a look. The group's name was, Today is Another Day to Pay Homage to Bessie. Giggling, she closed the group chat. After Bessie put Kara into the group, she took a picture of her written music score, clicked on Noah's profile, and directly sent it to him. Then, she started packing her books. Are you going to the library today? Alyssa climbed off her bed. Bessie picked up her backpack. No, I'm going back home. While pulling the zipper closed, she returned a message to Michael, then left the bedroom after bidding farewell to Kara and Alyssa. Denora didn't speak. Previously, she basically socialized with people from the student union. But these two days, she realized Kara was close to Gary, so she had subconsciously stayed behind in the dormitory. Unfortunately, Kara, Gary, Kai, and the others weren't easy to approach and she had achieved no progress even after several days. After Bessie left, she turned on her phone, clicked on Sherry's Twitter profile, and sent her a message. Cousin, can you lend me your poker tournament account? Episode 289 Inviting Kara to join Bessie's high school game group Carrying a black backpack, 
Bessie went to Dean Soup's office for a new set of books before going out. Downstairs, she bumped into Kai and Gary, both holding documents. Bessie! Kai immediately waved at her. Where are you going? Are you going to the snack street too? Gary also waved to her. No, I'm going out. She held her books with the other hand and lowered her eyelashes, covering the fact that her eyes were bloodshot. She carried seven nuclear engineering textbooks in total, each of them rather heavy. The weight of the seven books amounted to a total of several kilograms. I'll carry them for you, Kai said very gentlemanly. If the other boys in the class saw him letting one of the only two girls in their class carry a stack of books by herself without his help, he would certainly be scolded by them. Weighing the books in her hand, Bessie replied, Thanks, but they're not heavy. In the past few days, lots of rumors about her had spread on the forum, but the boys from her class didn't believe them. After military training, they understood her temper and knew she never had much contact with boys usually. Most of her contacts were merely friends. Hearing this, Kai also remembered her feet during military training. The books would feel as heavy as iron in other people's hands, but she carried them in one hand, lith like a swallow. He silently retracted his hand. By the way, do you want some computer science notes? Kai pointed to Gary. Gary has already summarized the essence of every topic. Let Kara bring them to you next time. Gary was a little cold, and upon hearing this, he just nodded and said in a clear voice, but Luke is an excellent graduate of the computer science department, so you might not need it. The three of them walked on the road, discussing the series of issues in the science and technology department. Not many people were at the school gate. Glancing around, Bessie saw Michael among the crowd at a glance, standing out from everyone else. I'm leaving now. She waved to them and walked towards Michael. He casually stood by the side of the road with his mobile phone his eyes sweeping across the crowd indifferently. His posture was lazy and his expression was nonchalant. He didn't usually drive when he came to the school, since it wasn't far. Furthermore, he was afraid of adversely affecting her. Noticing her knitted eyebrows, he stopped and also frowned. Then he reached out for Bessie's books, glancing at Gary and Kai. Both of them looked okay, but in Bessie's eyes, they probably weren't of high standards. Michael just politely greeted them. Kai responded quickly, Hello. After Bessie and Michael left, Kai stared at their backs for a long time before returning to his senses. His first impression of the man was that he was very handsome. Although his moves and his tone seemed very polite, Kai felt an inexplicable strong sense of oppression from him. His temperament and even his style of talking were extraordinary, cold, and arrogant. Especially considering his age, he didn't look like the society person as Denora had described and seemed only two years older than them. Yet he felt increasingly inferior the longer he stared at him. Looking away, he touched his chin. Everyone in the class can give up on being her boyfriend now, but Bessie is really a little strange. Why? Gary walked towards the snack street. Isn't it weird? She's carrying a knapsack that is old and worn out, but she's also wearing very expensive limited edition sneakers. Kai pondered and couldn't help smirking. These kinds of sneakers are usually bought as part of a collection by sneakers fans. Only someone like her would wear them. And the thermos she brought to military training? Do you remember? The diamonds on it are real. That night, Rosemary came over to eat after hearing that Bessie had returned. Sitting casually at the dining table, she looked around the empty table and knocked on it. Where's Bessie? she asked. Sitting opposite her, Michael held his fork with his beautiful fingers and casually explained. She's reading in the study. So hardworking, I... Rosemary put her hands down and stood up, about to head upstairs. Without looking up, Michael slowly said, You can try to get her to take a break. Having turned around already, Rosemary squeezed her wrists and then sat back down with a sheepish smile after ten seconds. I remember Northwestern University's teaching system is very strict. 
I won't bother Bessie. After eating, Michael went upstairs to see Bessie, but instead of leaving, Rosemary sat on the sofa and attacked Marvin with the World Poker Tour's affairs. Marvin kept fiddling with the flowers without saying anything. Resting her chin in her hands, Rosemary smiled. Marvin, you've spread your wings. Although she hadn't received any reply, she guessed from Marvin's attitude that there must indeed be some inside story about the World Poker Tour's contract. Folding her arms, she glanced upstairs. Marvin was speechless. Upstairs, Michael took a thermos into the study. He used this study often. A pot of mint flowers sat on the desk and the curtains were half drawn. Michael glanced around and saw Bessie lying on the table. Only half of her face was exposed and her eyelids were half closed. The coldness had faded from her face and her legs were leaning against the bottom of the table haphazardly. Even while sleeping, she still seemed not to be trifled with. She probably hadn't slept well in the past week or she wouldn't have fallen asleep while reading. Other than in the school doctor's office at the beginning of their friendship, Michael rarely saw her in this state. He rubbed his eyebrows involuntarily then walked over slowly and gently placed the teacup on her table. She didn't wake up. He took the pen out of her hand and called her twice, but she still didn't wake up. She seemed really sleepy. Standing by the table for two minutes, he went through a fierce debate in his mind about whether to wake her up to eat or to let her continue sleeping. In the end, he couldn't bear to wake her up. He bent down to pick her up easily and then opened the door. Bessie's room wasn't locked, so he went in and placed her down gently on the bed. He carefully removed his left hand from under her body and then cautiously withdrew his right hand off of the pillow, trying not to wake her up. Bessie moved a little, her eyebrows knitted. Appearing a little impatient, she rested her head on his right hand. As her slender hair weaved through his fingers, he moved lightly and pulled up her quilt with his left hand. After trying several times, he still failed to pull out his right hand from under her head. Sitting on the edge of the bed, he was silent for a while before snorting. Do you know who I am? Bessie slept quietly without answering. The next day, Bessie got up very early Glancing around the room, she pressed her temple with her right hand, looking thoughtfully at the door. Going downstairs with her thermos, she bumped into Marvin. Miss Miller, good morning. She raised her hand to check the time on her phone. It was 7 a.m., which was considered late compared to her usual time. But she had slept quite comfortably last night, so the redness in her eyes had faded a lot. She went to the kitchen to take a glass of milk, glancing around the hall. No one else was around. Marvin immediately understood. Michael has gone to Northwestern University. Just at that moment, Michael opened the door and came in, holding two pieces of paper. He saw Bessie and directly handed them to her. Should I bring back the things from your dormitory? While sitting on the chair and drinking milk, she read the papers handed to her. It was a notice to live outside the campus, signed by Dean Soup. The next one was a letter of guarantee signed by Michael. Glancing over, Marvin said in surprise, Miss Miller isn't living at school anymore. I'll go and get the flowers back. Bessie casually crossed her legs and glanced at the school notice in her hand. It was always hard to go from extravagance to frugality. She could still bear it at the beginning of military training and could go to the mountain with heavy loads to roast a pig when she was bored. But later on, after studying day and night, and coupled with the crowded school and noise, she didn't manage to sleep well for a week. She seemed to have returned to her early days in middle school and got up to read with headphones at night. She turned to look at Michael. He folded his arms and raised an eyebrow, glancing at her with a straight face. Not long after that, Marvin rushed to the bedroom to pick up Bessie's flowers and other necessities. He spoke with the resident advisor for the dormitory. As soon as she saw the word Clark on his ID card, she personally took him to the bedroom for Bessie's stuff. Marvin didn't even glance sideways along the way. 
After arriving in the bedroom, he checked with Kara and the others before entering to collect Bessie's things. He didn't dare to look around and only focused on Bessie's table. There weren't many things to bring. Other than the potted flower and her computer, there was also the manuscript that Michael had ordered him to pick up. He didn't bring back any clothes since she had plenty of them in the Highline Apartments. Just then, Denora returned. When she opened the door, she saw a familiar man's back at Bessie's table. His back seemed a little cold and not to be trifled with. Taken aback, Denora walked over to Kara. This is... Kara tilted her head and explained. He's packing up Bessie's things. She's not staying on campus anymore. Was he a family member? Denora's imagination ran wild. Marvin had already packed the things. He held the black suitcase in his left hand and the flower pot in his right. His body was imposing. His features were cold. His speech was strict. And his eyes shot rays of coldness. Mr. Marvin? Denora almost whispered. With the Episode suitcase in hand, he was headed out the door Moving back when he heard to the Denora's Highline apartment and stopped to look at her. Episode 291, he politely Us greeted her. I'm Episode Sherry's cousin, and we've met at my cousin's a birthday party real before. Estate buyer. Denora Episode 293, Play Episode 290, Moving Back to the Highline Apartments. Sherry's birthday party hadn't been small. It had been filled with people who could party without care in Evanston. Denora hadn't known many of them. But she had known Marvin as one of the people at the center of the circle at that time. Hearing the words, Sherry, Marvin's polite expression changed, and it became cold as iron. Unlike Bessie and Michael, he had yet to reach the point where he could forget things easily. People like Denora were plentiful in Evanston, and he couldn't remember everyone. If it had been a year ago, he wouldn't even have stopped to greet her. But now, not only was Sherry no longer his idol, but the most important thing was, both Christopher and Patrick had very sternly warned him of her. Although he wasn't very bright, he still remembered his brother's words carefully. Denora had never talked to Marvin, but had heard people mention him. He was a part of the Clark family, and she could only stare at him from afar during Sherry's banquet. She still smiled, despite his cold expression. Tucking her hair behind her ear, she said as if nothing was wrong. My cousin is going to take the intermediate membership exam soon. Marvin adjusted his hold on the suitcase and left without hesitation, like an unsentimental bellhop. He went straight downstairs. Back in the bedroom, Denora stared after him, and her smile fell. She sat back down on her stool in a daze. Alyssa put her book on the table. Do you know Bessie's family? Yeah. Taking her phone, Denora looked absentmindedly out of the balcony. Kara sat down on a chair, holding her chin indifferently in her hand. Did you hear? His last name is Clark the top of the several families that can't be messed with in school. Next time, try harder to ride on Bessie's coattails. She smiled. Alyssa nodded in agreement. Exactly. They chatted and laughed in good moods, but Denora didn't think it was funny at all. Marvin was the most valued subordinate of the Clark family's crown prince, Michael, and could enter and leave their house as he liked. It was a well-known fact in her social circle that most of the Clark family's heirs had to address Marvin respectfully. Was Bessie's boyfriend Marvin? How could she have anything to do with the Clark family? In the White family's house, Principal White entered a room where Kenneth was sitting. Principal White had opened the market during his three-month-long stay in Austria. After returning to Evanston, it took a week before he started organizing the White family's affairs. Grandpa. Kenneth stood up from the chair, his eyes cold. From now on, you'll take care of the Moss family's affairs in Austria. I've already found a successor for the Research Institute. Principal White glanced out the window. He used to entertain the idea of Kenneth being together with Bessie. 
At that time, one white family branch would have been in charge of the white family's authority, while the other would be in charge of the research institute. He had even specifically ruled out public opinion and transferred Kenneth from Evanston to Brightbow High School. But he eventually fancied that Anne, and in the end, Bessie had been snatched by the Clark family. When Kenneth first heard Michael mention this back in Chicago, he hadn't known who the successor was. It wasn't until after the final exam, when Bessie got full marks in physics and mathematics, that he came to a realization. So, at that time, he had rushed to Chicago urgently, wanting to ask Bessie about it. But he had returned to Austria after failing to meet with her. Yes, Grandpa. He bid farewell to Principal White before leaving the study. After he left, Principal White dialed Bessie's cell phone. Bessie was in the study upstairs at Michael's apartment. Michael was using her phone to play games and was helping Tucker by recording a video of his screen. After sending the screen recording to him, he received a reply after a long while. You can't play as fast as my sister. Michael bit his cigarette and slightly narrowed his eyes. He was about to reply to him when a call appeared at the top of the phone, with only one word written. White. Bessie's saved contact names were extremely messy. There were strange names like Bird and Dragon. Michael had even seen one called Barbecue. Picking up the call, Michael headed downstairs and politely said, Wait a minute, Bessie's reading upstairs. On the other end of the phone, Principal White was silent for a while. Why are you answering her phone? Back in Chicago, he had requested that Michael look out for his successor, but now that Michael had snatched her away, he felt extremely uncomfortable. Mr. White? Michael was also silent for a while. He stood on the stairs and paused for a while before walking upstairs. Wait a moment. He opened the study door and saw Bessie writing in her textbook. It's Mr. White. He handed her the phone. Putting the pen down on the table, Bessie took the phone and answered. Principal White? Do you have time? Principal White stood by the window, looking outside with deep eyes. If so, let's continue to talk about Chicago. Wait. Bessie put her hand to her temple. Wait until I've finished my midterm exam. Midterm exam? Principal White sounded surprised. He held the phone with his other hand and asked, What major are you studying? Bessie told him. Principal White paused and then said, Not bad. Both were difficult majors, but they were related to each other. Since she had agreed to be his successor and was also in Evanston, he wasn't particularly anxious. She naturally wouldn't break her promise. The matter of his successor mustn't be rushed, and it involved many forces. When the time came, Evanston would be in a pitiful state. Before that, he had to make thorough preparations in all aspects. They exchanged a few more words before hanging up. Bessie leaned back in her chair and passed the phone to Michael. With a little bit of water left in his cup, he poured it out before refilling it, not taking the phone from her. Raising an eyebrow, she looked a little peevish. You... She originally thought he was going to ask about Principal White. Pulling a chair over, he pointed to her phone and said matter-of-factly, Your brother scolded me. Scolded him? Bessie lowered her head and flipped through Twitter to see what Tucker had said. She slowly replied to him. He played it for the first time like you. You're worse than him. After replying to Tucker, she handed the phone back to Michael. He took it and glanced at it, then stood up and left with the phone. Closing the study door, he clicked on Tucker's profile, and while the other party was typing, he sent a message. Terrible brother, smiley face. In less than a second after confirming that Tucker had seen this sentence, he quickly withdrew it and sent another smiley face. Downstairs, Marvin returned with Bessie's luggage. He put the suitcase in the middle of the hall and carefully placed the flower pot by the window. He couldn't help frowning at the sight of the wilted leaves. Bessie just couldn't take care of flowers. 
He had just picked up the tools when Patrick came upstairs. Patrick, why are you back? Patrick glanced around the hall. Michael told me to come. Sit first. Michael said he was still casually playing the game. Taking the shovel, Marvin sat down with Patrick. What's the matter? Something important. Michael's voice was unhurried. Patrick, how long do you need to move the central financial resources back? The entire center? The same one as the World Poker Tours? Patrick was surprised. Michael leaned on the sofa. Yeah, it took the World Poker Tour more than a year to do it. They only started settling in Evanston last year, but we have several strongholds here already. If we were to move the finances, it'll take a few months faster than them, but Michael... Are you sure? The corner of Patrick's mouth twitched. Was he trying to make Evanston explode? Yes. Michael was still playing the game. I can't afford not to see Mr. White. Patrick stared at him. He didn't even see Joshua, but he wanted to see Mr. White? It was just that... What did this have to do with Mr. White? After finishing a round, Michael looked at the screen recording before sending it to Tucker. Patrick took out his work computer and quickly logged onto the website. He took the time to glance at Michael. Then, I want to hold a high-level meeting right away. What's the specific reason? Michael continued playing on the phone and just said, Just do it. Nothing else. He only glanced upstairs and stretched his hand lazily to rub his forehead. If Joshua knew about the successor of the largest research institute in Evanston, he wouldn't be able to sit still. Michael hadn't read too much into it when Mr. White mentioned his successor back in Chicago. He just wondered how crazy the person was for rejecting him. It wasn't until a series of things came together later when he noticed Mr. White's anxiety over Bessie's injured hand that he started harboring suspicions in his heart. Later, his suspicions were confirmed when her scores in the joint exam came out. He slowly tapped the phone with his fingers. Since Patrick didn't dare go to the study room upstairs occupied by Bessie, he carried his computer to his room downstairs. He had already contacted all the higher-ups, and now he initiated a video call. As he placed the computer on the table, several people sitting at a big round table appeared on the screen. Their expressions were serious, and their voices were heavy. Mr. Clark, what happened to the corporation? Such emergency meetings rarely occurred. Move the headquarters. Patrick pulled out a document from his desk and flipped through it. In the video, a middle-aged man with gold rim glasses paused. Move? To where? To Evanston. Patrick raised his eyes. He had already ordered his subordinates to choose a base in Evanston. Evanston? The group of people in the video exchanged glances. I heard that the World Poker Tour just moved to Evanston. Why did they have to move their headquarters to Evanston all of a sudden? Why was Evanston attracting all the big bosses? Were they gathering together for a meeting?